Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for being in attendance today. My name is Michael McNichol. I'm an engineer at a small consulting company called Maine Marine Composites. We're located in Portland, Maine. Um, our firm does a lot of work in computer modeling, uh, in simulation, in ocean engineering, and in hydrodynamics. And I am here today to talk about uh, one of the more interesting simulation models that we worked on recently. Uh, this project was, was a rare foray for our company into the world of marine biology. We usually operate more uh, in the mechanical engineering and in the ocean engineering world. Uh, but this was a study, uh, a project to study and to simulate how leatherback sea turtles become entangled in mooring equipment. It was a project that we did uh, using MSC Adams primarily, uh, which we submitted last year to MSC's Simulating Reality Contest, which is uh, how we ended up here giving this webinar. So before I start talking about turtles, I want to talk a little bit about Maine Marine Composites, uh, who we are, what we do. As I said, we're a company of ocean engineers primarily. Uh, we specialize in computer simulation, uh, design, optimization. We have our offices in the Marine Trade Center right on the waterfront here in Portland, Maine. Um, we consult with companies in the oil and gas industry, in the marine hydrokinetics industry, in the offshore wind industry, and more and more recently in the aquaculture industry. So just to give you a flavor of the variety of projects we work on, here are a few uh, screenshots of some projects we've done. On the top left is a tidal energy turbine. Below that's a floating offshore wind turbine. In the middle is a photograph of uh, one of our engineers working on a floating mussel farming raft. On the bottom right is a simulation model we developed of a Coast Guard aid to navigation buoy deployment. And on the top right is a vessel that we did a spectral fatigue analysis on. Uh, if anybody is uh, watching this webinar from the UK, you've probably heard of the Queen's Ferry Crossing Replacement Bridge that was just recently completed. Uh, this was near Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, it's now the largest three-tower cable stay bridge in the world, the largest bridge in the UK. Uh, the construction of the bridge was, was a massive project, a multi-year project, and Maine Marine Composites was a part of that work. We conducted simulations and provided guidance on how to lift segments of the bridge uh, from a moored barge into position using large cranes that were stationed on the existing uh, under construction section of the bridge. We simulated the response of the barge, the loads on the crane lines, the holding strength of the barge mooring lines during lifting. We did all this under a variety of different uh, uh, sea states, wind conditions, and, and helped the bridge constructors to assess what weather windows would be safe for lifting. Another sample project we completed a couple years ago was with, uh, the Department of Energy's Wave Energy Prize. So this was a competitive grant project that looked to identify private, uh, promising wave energy conversion technologies. So uh, looking at technologies that use energy from ocean waves to generate renewable power. Uh, we consulted for one of the candidate technologies, which ended up uh, as a finalist among the 100 or so initial applicants. Our role in this project was to conduct numerical simulation of the uh, proposed wave energy converter to use genetic algorithm optimization to tune the geometry of the system so that it generated the most power possible, you know, had the best hydrodynamic performance. Uh, and a component of this competition was to conduct 20 scale model tests at the Mask Wave Basin in the U.S. Navy's Carter Rock facility. So we went, uh, we went down there during testing, provided on-site support and guidance for the wave energy development team. Uh, and as I said, we've done a lot of work recently in the world of aquaculture. So we've done analysis work looking at uh, analyzing ocean data to identify extreme ocean conditions for aquaculture deployments. We've analyzed strengths and stresses on aquaculture structures. Uh, we're currently working on a, a design project for an array of moored aquaculture rafts, which you can uh, see in the center figure here. We've done research in aquaculture. We've researched uh, novel simulation tools for modeling aquaculture systems, like smooth particle hydrodynamics, or SPH. We're currently working on uh, a research project related to farming of kelp. Uh, so that, that's just kind of an idea of the types of projects that, that we do at Maine Marine Composites. Um, so now I'm going to uh, talk about the main topic of this presentation, which is simulation of leatherback turtle using MSC Adams. So let me start with a brief outline of my talk. Uh, by way of uh, introduction, I'm going to give some background on leatherback turtles, discuss the types of bycatch and entanglement that threaten them, uh, how prevalent these problems are. And I'll show you a video of a sea turtle encountering a mooring line, which sort of gives a sense of entanglement uh, can occur, how it does occur. And I will discuss our research aims uh, in detail how we developed our computer simulation model. 
I've developed this, uh, I've, I've divided this simulation model uh, into three sections, anatomy, locomotion, and entanglement. The first anatomy being uh, the development of the solid contact body, which was made to be as realistically shaped as possible. Uh, the second locomotion being the development of the forces that propel the turtle, the articulations that move the turtle, and, and a, a global control algorithm that helps to maneuver it. And then the third entanglement being the development of, um, of a vertical mooring rope that was that was numerically stable enough uh, to undergo entanglement around a turtle. And then finally, I'll discuss the results of our work, which we produced an encounter between a leatherback turtle and a mooring line, uh, and investigate ways in which we can strive to mitigate the consequences of entanglements. All right, so uh, here are some turtle facts to get us started. And, and let me insert a disclaimer right up front that I'm an engineer, not a biologist. Uh, so I think it's important to have the background on what we're studying. Um, this uh, certainly is not my area of expertise, though. So that being said, uh, leatherback turtles are the largest turtle species in the world, larger than most people from head to tail up to about seven feet. Their wingspan is even larger than that. Um, and you can see from the map here that uh, leatherback turtles are found pretty much worldwide. So their major, their major uh, nesting sites are shown in the yellow and the red dots on this map. Uh, but you can see there really are few places that they don't go once they've once they've grown up. <laughs> uh, the the size of the leatherback turtle makes it possible for it to survive in much colder climates than other species of of sea turtles. To me, uh, the most impressive aspect of leatherbacks is how well equipped they are to move through the ocean. Their bodies are are incredibly hydrodynamically shaped. Their shell, as the name implies, is more leathery and soft than most turtles. Uh, and as you can see from the figure here, it's very streamlined to help the turtle move through the ocean. It's got sort of a teardrop shape. Uh, the front flippers drive all the forward motion. They have very long wingspan, up to about nine feet across. So their streamlined shape, their powerful flippers, make them the fastest turtle species in the world. And they get the energy to do all this uh, just by eating jellyfish. Now the goal of our study was to help the scientific and the engineering communities to mitigate bycatch and entanglement of sea creatures with fishing equipment, with mooring equipment. So our work was directed towards entanglement of leatherback sea turtles and mooring lines. Uh, but as you'll see over the course of this talk, uh, there, there's really no reason our approach cannot be applied to any number of different marine species, any number of different entanglement problems. So some statistics just to set the stage. The bottom line is uh, that a lot of turtles die as a result of bycatch. So this first study I've cited here identified 85,000 instances of bycatch over about an 18-year span. Um, but the authors of the study stressed that because underreporting is very common in many places of the world, this number is drastically underrepresentative of reality. Uh, the authors predict that it, it underrepresents reality by several orders of magnitude. Now in our neck of the woods, which is to stay off the coast of New England, New York, New Jersey and the Gulf of Maine, entanglements between turtles and mooring lines, lobster pot lines, and so on is a large problem and, and a growing problem. Entanglement by catch of turtles in, uh, occurs in all types of offshore equipment. So I've diagrammed here uh, three of the most common. In the top left figure is a trawling net, which is one of the most dangerous pieces of offshore equipment to turtles. The trawling nets are, are particularly dangerous because they're indiscriminate in what they catch, meaning that anything that happens to be in the way of the net will be caught in it. A turtle stuck in a trolley net will, will often be stuck and will, will, will often drown because the nets will stay submerged for a very long period of time so they can't reach the surface to breathe. On the top right is a diagram of a lobster trap and buoy. This is a common source of entanglement in the Gulf of Maine off the coast of New England where we are. The arrangement here is pretty simple. Typically there's a surface buoy, there's a lobster trap or several lobster traps in series on the seabed, and then there's a single mooring line, typically synthetic rope connecting the, the lobster traps of the buoy. The line's often fairly slack as the change in tide will increase and decrease the water depth. And the fact that the line is slack rather than taut is relevant to entanglements as turtles will have an easier time escaping from very taut mooring lines. And finally on the bottom is a diagram of a long line fishing arrangement. So here there's a very long fishing line which is paid out by a fishing boat and at regular intervals there'll be buoys that'll keep the line close to the surface. And then there are uh, baited strands of rope that hang down from the line. So like nets, long lines are fairly indiscriminate in what they catch, which makes them controversial fishing tools. Turtles can often do become entangled in the horizontal lines. And uh, many species of fish, marine life, are snared by the baited lines as well. 
you can see a few screenshots of entangled turtles. So the turtle in the figure on the top left is swimming while it's caught around a vertical mooring line. The turtle in the other two lines is entangled around around the neck near a buoy in a long line. I mentioned uh, that trolley nets are particularly harmful to turtles. So one solution that works with moderate success is to employ what's called a turtle excluder device. And these devices prevent turtles from traveling all the way to the back of the nets where they'll become um, where they'll become entrapped. Uh, so you can see in the diagram on the left here, there's a metal screen which allows smaller fish to pass through. Um, but sort of filters out larger fish and turtles. And then there's an opening on the top of the net where the turtles can sort of be funneled out and escape. There are a lot of practical limitations with this approach. Enforcement's always a challenge in many parts of the world. Uh, and, and many larger turtle species like leatherbacks are often too large to actually fit through these openings. But what we're studying is, is entanglements in vertical mooring lines, not, not nets. There are a number of ways uh, which humans can harm turtles, as we've seen, but the one that's of greatest concern to us is, uh, is turtle entanglements with vertical mooring lines or lobster pot lines um, off the coast of New England. So many turtles are discovered after they become entangled uh, by, uh, by fishing ships, by, by the Coast Guard, whatever. Um, but it's actually it's very rare that entanglements are witnessed as they're occurring. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to play a short video for you now. So this is the only instance that our project team was able to uncover in which ent uh, an entanglement between a turtle and a mooring line was observed as it was happening. So you can see the turtle swim into the mooring line. Uh, here it it speeds up. It seems to notice that it's entangled and it turns around uh, to try and escape entanglement. And then it slows down again, which suggests the turtle thinks it has escaped. Of course, you can see it hasn't. Uh, this is a video that was taken off the coast of Martinique. And, and in this particular case, the diver who was taking the video freed the turtle, um, so the turtle was able to escape and go on its way. Uh, but this is the, the problem that we're trying to study, entanglement of turtles in mooring lines. So we're trying to understand how turtles get caught in mooring lines and how they so often get so entangled that they need to be rescued in order to survive. So those are the stakes. That's the problem that we're trying to study. As I've described, entanglements are almost never witnessed as they're happening in the field. So our aim was to develop a computer simulation model that could reproduce entanglement between a leatherback turtle and a mooring line. When we're able to achieve that, we'll have a tool that can do a few very important things. So first, it can help us, uh, us being the, the research community, the engineering community, to understand how turtles are becoming entangled in mooring lines uh, and how they're dying as a result of that entanglement. The second thing it provides us is a powerful visualization tool, which helps us to sort of observe this process that we never actually get to observe in the field. And the third thing it gives us is it gives us a tool that we can use to study uh, or develop innovations that can uh, protect turtles uh, by preventing or by mitigating the consequences of entanglements. So our effort was funded under a research grant by NOAA, the, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. NOAA is a federal agency whose mission is to study climate, weather, oceans, um, basically the natural world. They create weather forecasts. Their national data buoy center, uh, center monitors ocean conditions all around the country, around the world. And the grant that funded this project was a NOAA BREP grant. BREP is the Bycatch Reduction Engineering Program, which, as the name implies, is a grant program uh, that aims to reduce bycatch in all kinds of U.S. waters. For this project, our software tool of choice was MSC Adams. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, since this is an MSC webinar, most people in attendance are at least somewhat familiar with Adams. So I'm not going to get into what Adams does too much, uh, but I'll, I'll touch briefly on why we opted to use Adams as a, as a design tool. So we knew right away that we wanted a simulation tool that was a multi-body dynamics tool, which Adams is. We wanted to develop a model of a leatherback turtle with articulations allowing the flippers to move realistically. Uh, we wanted a model of a mooring line that was, that was dynamic and capable of very large bending. And the mooring line ended up being probably the most challenging piece in terms of numerical stability. Uh, because not only did, we have to, did, it, did it have to undergo very large bending as it became wrapped around the turtle flipper, 
but it had to undergo this very large bending while also undergoing solid contact with the fertile shell. So this ends up being a very stiff numerical problem. Uh, so another advantage of Adams was its selection of stiff differential equation solvers. And then the final reason we liked Adams was its control algorithms, uh, its internal control algorithms and its external ones, which are coupled to other software tools like Simulink. We anticipated some amount of control in our model to simulate things like maneuvering in a realistic way. So this diagram shows the, the workflow that we followed as we developed our model. The first step was to generate an accurate computer automated design model of the geometry of the turtle. Next step was to articulate the shoulder joints, uh, the flippers to allow them to move realistically and to generate the forces to propel the turtle forward. The third step was to develop a motion control algorithm. So in other words, once we can move the flippers, once we can propel the turtle forward, we needed a way to sort of tell it what, what course to follow. And the final step was to create a dynamic model of the mooring rope. And then all these pieces are combined. The, the final result was our finished computer model that allows us to simulate entanglement. So the first phase of this work was to develop an accurate uh, computer automated design CAD model of the turtle's geometry. Our primary references for this were, were uh, references like literature references, such as the, the screenshot of the leatherback skeleton that I've included here. Uh, and this life-size model of a leatherback turtle you see on the left here. This, this model came to us actually through another phase of our BREP research project in which uh, some of our uh, collaborators uh, were working on development of a full-scale automated turtle model in parallel with our sim uh, simulation work. So from a taxidermy company down in uh, Florida, they obtained the life-size model of the turtle. Uh, and, and having this model at our disposal helped our simulation efforts just to be able to take measurements and to sort of get a, a sense of the scale and the size and, and the shape of what we're dealing with. So in order to generate our CAD models, we scanned images of the turtle skeleton and the turtle mold into our computers and traced them with an open source software tool called Engage. Uh, these traces we then turned into a series of coordinates, a point cloud that gave us uh, dimensions of all the, the critical components of the turtle geometry, the shell, the flippers. We imported these programs then into our CAD software. The software tool we used was a program called Multisurf, which is uh, developed by a company called AeroHydro. <coughs> Multisurf is a, uh, a 3D design software tool which is uh, tailored toward the naval architecture community. Uh, but we have an engineer in the company who is very adept at, at using it in creative ways like this. So in Multisurf, we built a parametric model of the turtle shell, the flippers, the head, the tail, the, the entire exterior of the turtle with, with accurate dimensions, which are based on the literature and, and on measurements from our full-scale model that we had at our disposal. And here are a few screenshots then of, of the process in Multisurf. So we started by drawing slices of the shell, lofting them into a three-dimensional rendering. Uh, we used uh, digitized skeleton traces that sort of guided us as we as we created the, the flippers in the body. And then here's a screenshot of the final rendering of the shell and the head. And you can see, just by looking at it, how, how incredibly hydrodynamic the shape of the turtle is. Once again, it's, it's evolved to become very well adapted for a life of swimming in the ocean. And the next step was uh, to import our parametric multi-surf model into another CAD program called Rhino 3D, uh, just to sort of clean up some of the rougher aspects of our model. And you can see an image of this uh, screenshot of the Rhino 3D model of the turtle in the top right here. So Rhino 3D is a little bit easier to work with when it comes to uh, touching up CAD models and preparing them for sort of the final destination program, which in this case was Atoms. And so finally, our geometry was imported as a solid object into Atoms, which you can see on the bottom left. Um, so that's, that's a quick overview of the development of, of how we created the solid contact body in Atoms. We obviously needed this to be reasonably accurate as a rendering of the turtle because we wanted to ensure that contact between the turtle and the, and the mooring line, the rope, happened realistically. Uh, so that's why we took such a, a careful, deliberate approach to the CAD design work. Having created the geometry then, the next step was to develop articulations of the turtle. The goal here was for the flippers to move realistically uh, to generate the proper forces to propel the turtle forward. So you can see from the figure on the left, which I've borrowed from the literature, as the turtle swims, the flippers don't simply move up and down. They also move forward and backward. And they twist in order to optimize the angle of attack. 
So in our model, motion was imposed in all three rotational degrees of freedom. The rear flippers were not articulated for two reasons. Um, first being that leatherback turfs don't rely on their rear flippers to do all that much. So all the forward propulsion is generated by the large front flippers. The rear flippers uh, act like rudders. They help in navigation, help the turtle to turn, but they don't push the turtle forward. And the second reason we did not articulate the rear flippers was because all of the research suggests that entanglements happen exclusively with the front flippers, with the shell, with the body, the head, the neck, but never, never with the rear flippers. So for our purposes, there just wasn't much of a reason that they needed to be articulated. So here's a quick animation to show you the, uh, the motion of the articulated front flippers. In order to move the turtle in a realistic way, then, we had to calibrate it against uh, the motion of actual turtles. So these videos of turtles like the one I'm playing for you right now, uh, and data from the literature where it was available, to figure out things like the amplitude of motion of the front flippers, the frequency of motion, or, or the beat response of the flippers, the speed that the turtle swims, the axis of rotation of the shoulder. Uh, and these data points aren't constant, right? Uh, so turtles will swim at different speeds depending on what their objectives are. They'll flap their flippers harder and faster if they're trying to escape entanglement, for instance. Uh, the amount of twist of the flippers will change sometimes. Um, so, so their their motion, their, their their flapping behavior will be a little bit different, and and from turtle to turtle, it'll vary too. So, there's a lot of variation in all that. And here's uh, one more video that shows uh, oops, that shows uh, how the leatherback turns. So you can see that, that as it turns, it, it sort of flaps its outer flipper and pivots around the inner flipper. And I'll play that one more time just because the, the quality on my screen wasn't very good. So the, the joints, the motions, and the forces that we applied to the turtle in our Adams model can be divided into three pieces. So first were the, the motions of the flippers, which are rotational joints that we applied to the shoulder of the turtle. And these motions are shown in this figure as the green arrows. Uh, the second were force vectors that provided forward propulsion. These are the red arrows, which are shown on the flippers. And the third was a global motion controller, which helped to steer and to maneuver the turtle. And these are, uh, these are the, the red arrows in the center of the turtle. They were implemented as torques applied to the centroid of the turtle body. So looking a little more closely at the shoulder joints, we implemented these in atoms as general point motions. All degrees of freedom were prescribed, although the translational degrees of freedom were set to zero relative to the shell. Uh, at first approximation, we modeled the flapping as just a simple sinusoidal motion. Um, from our observations, though, uh, from our research, we decided this first approximation probably wasn't adequate. So we improved our model using a step function in atoms. Uh, step functions, for those of you who don't know, give smooth transition between a, a specified upper and lower limit. So by setting the independent variable the uh, sinusoidal function at time and the upper and lower limits to be just the the upper and lower limits of the stroke of the turtle's flipper. Uh, we can step back and forth between the top and the bottom and sort of flatten out the top of the curve and the bottom of the curve. So the turtle, as it's flapping its flippers, will sort of pause briefly at the top and the bottom of its stroke. And as I've sort of hinted at already, the frequency, the amplitude of motion of the flippers was not treated as constant, uh, but was a function of the global maneuvering controls, which I'll, I'll get into in the next few slides. So in order to generate the forward propulsion of the turtle, then we used the lift and a drag model. And I've outlined here how we implemented that model in atoms um, at a high level. And I'll talk about each of these pieces uh, in the next few slides. Basically, our approach was to create measurements of the local velocities of the turtle flippers at the center of drag and, and then look up lift and drag coefficients that corresponded to those velocities. And these lift and drag coefficients came from published studies. Uh, and then finally, we converted the, the local lift and drag forces to global forces to propel the turtle forward. So we employed a lift and drag model in the flippers in order to generate propulsion. So the forces we're generating are the lift force, the drag force that, that are pushing the turtle. And these forces will depend on the angle of attack of the flipper. Um, and the angle of attack in turn will depend on the relative velocity of the flipper relative to the water. 
So the first step in our model was um, to create a measurement in atoms that would tell us the relative velocity. So as I show in the figure here, the relative velocity is the vector sum of the, the flipper motion and the motion of the turtle as it's moving through the water. And I'm assuming here that the water is not moving. If it was, if there was a steady current or something, we would have to take that into account as well. Uh, the angle of attack then is measured in atoms um, as the difference between the chord line of the flipper, which is this dashed line in the figure, uh, and the relative velocity. And the graph that I've plotted here, uh, I, I plot the measured angle of attack from our atoms model, which is compared uh, compared with the smaller inset graph here. Uh, this graph comes from a published study of motion tracking experiments, which were done on a loggerhead turtle. Uh, and you can see our results match up pretty well in terms of the shape and the amplitude of, of the, the change in angle. Uh, there's a small dip in the middle of the peak on our curve we don't see in the loggerhead data, and this could be due to a lot of things. Um, for example, maybe there's just a slight difference in the motions between loggerhead and other back turtles. Um, and, and a small disclaimer here, loggerhead turtles are a smaller species of turtle than leatherbacks, so there may be some differences in how they behave. Um, but to our knowledge, there has not been a similar study, similar motion tracking study done on, on leatherback turtles that we could use. So at each instant of time, then, we measure the angle of attack of the flippers. And knowing that angle of attack, we can look up the, the corresponding lift and drag coefficients. So as you can see in this graph here, uh, the lift coefficient, which is the red line, the drag coefficient, which is the dashed blue line, will both vary as functions of angle of attack. Uh, and, and as I'm sure many of you know, lift and drag coefficients are very difficult to determine using simulation. Uh, require computational fluid dynamic CFD modeling, which is well outside the scope both of what Adams uh, is capable of doing and, and what the scope of our project was. Uh, so. For our purposes, we used uh, these coefficients which were available to us from the literature. The coefficients in the graph come from the same uh, paper as the angle of attack data from the previous slide, which means it was measured for a loggerhead turtle. Um, but, but here we have the advantage that lift and drag coefficients are non-dimensional, meaning that uh, in theory uh, they shouldn't depend on the size of the flipper. So we can have some confidence that even though we're looking at different species, we're not too far off as long as the shape of the flipper is reasonably similar. And once, once we measure these coefficients, we can calculate the lift force and the drag force on the flippers that, that are pushing the turtle forward. And we repeat this process then at every instant of time for both flippers independently throughout the entire simulation. So the final step in, in the propulsion model is that the lift and the drag forces will provide a forward acceleration on the turtle. And to counter that, there's, there's a fluid drag on the body that we apply on the shell that slows it down or that, that resists this forward acceleration. And so the net of that will generate a forward velocity. And again, I've, car I've, I've compared this forward velocity that we measured in our model to measurements of a loggerhead turtle from the literature. Since turtles, since, since logger, loggerhead and leatherback turtles don't swim at the same speed, because they're, they're different species, loggerheads are smaller turtles, it doesn't make sense to compare the actual velocity values. Um, but you can see from the trends of the two blue lines here, the blue line on the bottom curve is, is the forward velocity component. Uh, the, the Adams model moves reasonably similar to the, the loggerhead model. So then, uh, just to summarize this, the forward velocity depends on the lift and drag forces. Those forces will depend on the angle of attack and the relative velocity of the fluid. And the relative velocity of the fluid will depend on how quickly and how hard the turtle is beating its flippers. So the next thing to consider is, uh, how do we determine the amplitude, the frequency of the flipper motion? So to answer that question, uh, I'll start talking now about how we handle maneuvering of the turtle on a more global scale. So in other words, we've now answered the question, what, what propels the turtle forward? But we need to now uh, answer, also answer the question, how does the turtle move from point A to point B? How does it turn? How does it respond to its environment? And most importantly for, for this project, when it encounters a mooring line, how does it respond to that? We explored two different approaches to go about answering this question. Uh, we called these approaches the waypoint motion and the direct motion or controller approaches. So just intuitively, the waypoint approach gives the turtle a target to follow. So think of this like the turtle uh, chasing a point or, or a jellyfish or something through the ocean. We prescribe the path of the jellyfish and then the controller 
directs how the turtle will respond to changes in that path. The direct motion approach gives the turtle a target uh, velocity and orientation. So this would be more akin to the turtle uh, thinking to itself, you know, I just want to swim forward at a normal pace. Uh, and then as it encounters a mooring line, it'll, it'll suddenly think you know, something's wrong. I should turn around or I should speed up or something to escape this, this thing I've collided with. So in, in both cases, we handled the actual maneuvering of the turtle the same way. We applied torques at the centroid of the body, which mimic the effects of the rear flippers, which, uh, remember, act as rudders, steer the turtle, but which we did not articulate in our model. We also controlled the amplitude, the frequency of the flippers to control speed, and that ties directly into the lift and the drag forces that propel the turtle forward, uh, as, I, as I discussed in the previous slides. And this also plays a role in turning the turtle, right? So if one flipper is beating, the other isn't, the mismatch will the mismatch in the propulsion will, will uh, steer the turtle to the left or to the right. So I will uh, dive first a little bit more deeply into the waypoint motion approach that we took. In maneuvering of vessels and unmanned underwater vehicles, waypoints are target destinations that the vessel is aiming to reach. So each, each waypoint will be time stamped. Uh, so the waypoint represents a point that, that the vessel, or, or for us the turtle, tries to reach by a specified time. So based on, on the destination, uh, I'm sorry, based on the distance from the waypoint um, and the speed that the turtle is moving at and the amount of time it has to reach that point, it will speed up or it will slow down. And, and uh, similarly, based on the difference between the heading it's going at and the, the heading it has to go at to reach the waypoint, it will turn to the left or to the right or turn up or down. We used a PID control scheme, proportional integral derivative control scheme, to make these motions more continuous, more, more lifelike, um, to control how these uh, torques were applied at the turtle body. So let me uh, walk through how this works with a diagram. Uh, so in the figure uh, here, there are five waypoints drawn labeled A through E, with a timestamp shown for each of them. So if the turtle is able to follow a perfect path towards each waypoint, it would follow the green curve that, that we've drawn here. Uh, however, there's some delay in acceleration and deceleration of the turtle um, because our PID control scheme doesn't instantly respond, uh, and, and the turtle doesn't turn instantly either. There's some delay in how the torques are applied. So this figure shows the turtle's position and its orientation at time 3.5 seconds. So it's followed the blue curve so far. You'll notice, looking at the blue curve, it missed waypoint B at time 1 second. It missed waypoint C at time 3 seconds. And now it's uh, it has adjusted its heading for the next waypoint, which is waypoint D. And in this snapshot, you can also see the turtle's about to miss waypoint D as well. So its new target is going to be waypoint E. So from now until uh, time seven seconds, the torques that we apply will, will maneuver the turtle to orient it towards waypoint E, and it will presumably uh, speed up to try and reach that target in time. So uh, here's, a, here's a movie that sort of shows this process. So the black trace that, that you can see in front of the turtle is the, the target waypoint that the turtle is trying to reach. Uh, the, the intensity that it flaps its flippers is driven by ex our external control system and is a function of how far the turtle is from its target. We, uh, we apply torques at the centroid of the turtle body, which, as I said, represent the uh, action of the rear flippers, which sort of behave like rudders. This drives turning and maneuvering of the turtle as it, as it chases this waypoint through the ocean. And, we, and as I said, we use a PID control system to increase, to decrease the intensity of the flapping and to apply the torques. Uh, and, and the PID system is tuned based off of the qualitative observations to, to make the motions appear more realistic. The uh, second approach that we took to global motions was what we called the direct motion approach. In this approach, instead of giving the turtle a, a waypoint to follow, we prescribe a target heading and a target velocity. So at each instant in time, we measure the error between the actual heading and the actual velocity of the turtle and its targets. And again, we use our PID controller, um, which I should mention we developed through co-simulation with Simulink, uh, to correct these errors. So while both of these approaches, the, the waypoint motion approach and the direct motion approach, sort of reflect their own realities, 
what we found is that this direct motion approach works better when it comes to simulating entanglements. Uh, it, it better reflects how a turtle would behave uh, as, it, as it encounters a mooring line, as it becomes entangled in a mooring line. So essentially, if a turtle is trying to escape from entanglement, it's not thinking about target destinations. It's thinking about doing things like speeding up and like, like turning around. So it's focusing more on its own position and speed than on a position that it wants to get to. And here's uh, a short animation to show how the direct motion approach works. The graph on the bottom left shows the turtle's target and actual yaw angles. And on the right is the, the turtle's target and actual velocities. So as the turtle speeds up, it gets closer to its target velocity. Uh, but there's some bias in our controller that, that doesn't allow it to actually ever reach this target velocity. Uh, and the target yaw angle you can see specifies a 60 degree turn at around 9 seconds into the simulation. Um, and you can see that the yaw controller overshoots that target slightly, but corrects it pretty quickly as it makes that turn. So with the simulation model of the turtle then in hand, the next step was to move on to developing a dynamic model of the mooring line. We wanted the mooring line to have realistic material properties. In particular, uh, we were focused on having realistic bending stiffness compared with typical mooring materials. Uh, and, and there's a lot of variability in what constitutes a typical mooring material. Uh, but we chose to use uh, sort of a common off-the-shelf nylon rope, which is of the type that a lobster trap might be moored with. So there were a number of um, numerical challenges we had to overcome here. Entanglement, just by its very nature, requires very large deformation or bending of the rope. It also requires solid body contact with the turtle shell. And having both of these things happen at the same time is, is a difficult numerical problem. So numerical stability was uh, a challenge we fought with pretty consistently in this phase of the modeling work. We tried a few different approaches here before we settled on the one that worked the best for us. The first approach we took was to model the rope with a flexible body and atoms. So this is uh, essentially a cylindrical finite element body that, that can um, be directly inserted into the atoms model without having to do any other work up front. And we can tune the material properties to match the bending stiffness of the rope that we're looking at. So this is the simplest approach, uh, still fairly numerically robust. Um, unfortunately, we never really managed to get this approach to work. There were some sort of practical limitations we struggled to get around. One being that we couldn't vary the discretization of the rope. So in order to have such large bending in one specific point on the rope around the flipper, we had to specify very small discretization all the way through the entire rope, which was uh, a challenge in terms of simulation time. And we struggled with numerical convergence during some of the very large bending bendings, um, especially during contact with the turtle. <coughs> So the second approach we took was to develop a lumped mass model of the rope. Uh, this was, in theory, quite a straightforward approach, um, but it involves a lot of pieces, a lot of moving parts inside of the Adams model. So for this approach, we modeled the rope with a series of cylinders, each cylinder uh, connected to the next with a torsional spring. And the stiffness of those torsional springs is tuned to match the bending stiffness of the rope uh, and to prevent torsion. The mass of the rope then is distributed in the cylinders so that the springs are assumed to be uh, massless, which is sort of the intrinsic assumption of lumped mass models. And the contact forces are also assigned to the cylinders, so the springs only handle the bending stiffnesses. Uh, so in order to sort of help with all the bookkeeping in this, we used a MATLAB routine to, to construct a command file that had all of these pieces for the rope that we could import into atoms. Each segment of the spring uh, required a cylinder, uh, a torsional spring, a solid body, a uh, solid contact force with the turtle shell, and a solid contact force with each of the flippers. So there was a lot of bookkeeping to handle all these, all these different pieces. Uh, and we used the MATLAB routine that we wrote also to vary the size of the cylinders over their arc length. So in order to balance numerical efficiency with the very large bending around the flipper, we varied the lengths of the cylinders so that where contact occurs with the turtle, there's, uh, the, the cylinders are very small, so that they can bend over a very small radius. Uh, but farther away where contact is less likely, they, they could be much longer without having any consequences. And, and you can see a, a plot of how this works on the, 
on the bottom of this figure here. Uh, so the uh, the x-axis shows the vertical position of the mooring, so just the arc length of the mooring line, and the y-axis shows the size of the cylinders at each point in the line. So they get shorter right around where we expect contact to occur with the turtle flippers. So here are uh, two animations that show how the lumped mass model, uh, rope model, worked in atoms. The first just shows how the rope moves as it swings through like a pendulum with no obstacles or anything. And then the second animation shows how it handles contact with the turtle. So putting all the pieces together then, we now have a simulation model where we can specify how the turtle moves. We can observe how it interacts with the rope, whether it becomes entangled, whether it collides with the rope it manages to escape, or, or whatever else. So backing up and looking at the big picture then, uh, what are we hoping to get out of this work? Well, the first thing we want is a better understanding of how entanglements occur. The second thing we want is a tool that can help us to develop technologies to mitigate entanglements. So using the information that we have on how exactly turtles become entangled, we took our model, put all the pieces together, and came up with a uh, realistic behavior the turtle might follow as it collides with the mooring line. And this took a lot of trial and error, a lot of experimentation, uh, and, and the results uh, we end up with is based largely on, on that movie I showed you right up front at the beginning of the talk. So here's an animation that shows uh, entanglement with a, a simplified version of our model. So in this version of the model, the rope's only partially implemented, um, and the full motion controls are not implemented, so we're, we're prescribing much of the motion of the turtle. Uh, so it, it's, it's fairly simplified, but you can see how the turtle approaches the rope and collides with it. Um, and, and the motion that the turtle undergoes then is to, to turn around to try and escape from entanglement. And as it does that, uh, the turtle flipper will become wrapped around the rope and it becomes entangled around the flipper. And here's an animation then of the model with all the pieces fully implemented. So in this animation, the turtle has the full control algorithm implemented to move it. Um, and as it swims, it swims normally towards the mooring line. And then as it collides with the mooring line, uh, it again, it, it tries to turn around to escape it, which it does by sort of pivoting around its inner flipper, which it holds relatively still. Uh, and the turn that the turtle takes, as you can see, makes the entanglement worse, so that by the time it's completed its turn, it's gone from just in contact with the line to completely entangled around the mooring line. So that is our starting point, sort of our control case. We can use our, our simulation model to reproduce entanglement with a vertical mooring line under normal circumstances. So the next objective is to investigate what enhancements we can make to the mooring system to make it safer, uh, to, to, to mitigate entanglements. So in order to show that our model can differentiate between different line types, different mitigation strategies, we took uh, three hypothetical modifications that one could make to the vertical mooring line, and we tested them in our model. So the first was to introduce a constant tension in the mooring line. So this would reflect a situation where there's some sort of a tensioning mechanism in the buoy or in the anchor or something that would keep it taut. And the hypothesis here is that the greatest likelihood for entanglement occurs when the mooring line is somewhat slack. The second strategy we looked at was to increase the bending stiffness of the mooring line. So we would hope that if the line is very stiff, it's not able to bend around a tight enough radius to actually wrap itself around the turtle's flipper. And the third strategy we looked at was to encase the mooring line in rigid segments. So this would reflect a situation where, um, for example, there's the line would be encased maybe in two foot long or so sections of some sort of a pipe maybe. Uh, so it can still bend every two feet, but in between those joints, it's completely rigid. So here's an animation of the first case, where the mooring line has a constant tension applied to it. Again, the turtle approaches the rope normally. This time, as it starts to turn, uh, oops. Uh, so it approaches the, uh, the rope normally. Uh, this time, as it starts to turn, um, it begins to get entangled in the same way. But because the rope doesn't go slack, as uh, the turtle beats its flippers, it, it manages to avoid getting completely wrapped around the flipper. So at the end of the simulation, the turtle hasn't escaped from entanglement, but the rope isn't tied around its flipper, so it's in better shape than in the, the control case that we looked at.
here's a, then an animation with the increased mooring material bending stiffness. So again, the turtle approaches the rope normally, and this time, because the rope is not able to bend around a very tight radius, the rope never really becomes entangled around the flipper. So as you can see, at the end of the simulation, the turtle hasn't completely escaped contact with the rope, uh, uh, but, but it's not entangled in any way that seems to be as dangerous as in the previous two animations. And finally, here's the animation in which the mooring line is segmented. And uh, you, can, you can sort of see this segmentation right here as the turtle starts to turn. It becomes a little more obvious as the turtle completes its turn. Uh, in this case, because the line is completely rigid except for at the joints, the turtle, as it flaps its flippers, manages to slip off completely and, and avoid entanglement altogether. So let me conclude then with just a few uh, key points and takeaways. So in this study, we developed a simulation model where we can reproduce entanglement of the leatherback turtle. We've used the model to look at several different strategies uh, that, could be, that, that could mitigate the effects of entanglement. The strategies were, were largely successful, although um, I would stress that they're, they're hypothetical solutions. They are not actual technologies that we investigated. One of the enduring values of this tool is that it can be very easily expanded to solve a whole host of related problems. So this is a tool that could be expanded to simulate bycatch of other species of marine animals, uh, species like whales or seals or other endangered species for whom entanglement is a serious problem. And this model could also be expanded to simulate bycatch of marine animals with other types of marine gear. Um, so some of the other gear that I discussed in the beginning of my talk, like long lines or dredging nets, for example. So there are a lot of ways in which this model uh, could be expanded and this work could be continued. So finally, in closing, let me just acknowledge uh, a few people and organizations who helped out with this project. Uh, first, NOAA, who funded the work, uh, MSC Software for, um, for providing me this opportunity to present my work to you all, uh, and, and for developing an excellent simulation tool that can support a project like this. Um, a few people to acknowledge, Cliff Gowdy was the PI on this project. Dick Akers did much of the, the CAD modeling that we saw in this, uh, in this presentation. And Toby Dewhurst helped me to uh, put together some of the slides. My contact information is here in case you have any questions or if you'd like to follow up with me directly.